Shalom Aleichem, dear brothers and sisters, in the name of Lord Jesus. As the title of the video says, The Bread That Came Down From Heaven, most of the brothers would have understood that we are going to delve into John chapter 6, one of the most important passages in the Bible. In this chapter, Lord says the attention-drawing phrase, Amen, Amen, truly, truly, verily, verily, I say unto thee four times, which shows us as to how crucial this chapter is. The passage that is known as the Bread of Life Discourse. Now the thing is that this passage has been explained by almost every theologian, every single expositor. This does not mean that it cannot be taken, it definitely can and should be taught. But the thing is that would we be able to dig and unearth some of the biblical treasures that are not found in those commentaries? Well, as we have done in most of our videos through Lord's help, we'd be doing so over here as well. And in order to not have a lengthy video, we would not be going verse by verse, but we would be understanding the heart of this passage, the essence of this highly crucial discourse. This is going to be the outline of the session. The first section is going to be salvation by works. It cannot be. What's this all about? Then we're going to go through Shmot 16, manna, a foreshadow of the true bread from heaven, the very strong New Testament shades found in Exodus 16. In the third section, among a few very important points, we would be looking ahead, that is in connection to John 6, we would be looking ahead to the crucifixion and the Lord's Supper. And the last section would be the remez found through the intertwining between manna and the Shabbat. So let's begin with the first section. Let's go to verse 26 and onward, which is the day after Lord Yeshua miraculously fed the 5,000 through just five barley loaves and two fish, and after he walked on water at night. So this next day, the crowd goes to Kafarnachum looking for Lord Jesus, and when they found him, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered and said to them, Amen, Amen, I say unto thee, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. All right. Now, everything that Lord says is important, but when Lord uses this phrase, Amen, Amen, I say unto thee, which I mentioned just a few seconds back, he is drawing the attention of the hearers back then and of the readers of the Bible to the words that are about to follow this attention-grabbing phrase. So, dear brethren, whenever you come across this phrase, always remember that whatever follows is extremely important. And what Lord means over here is that they were seeking him because he had fed them, because they were satisfied. But they were not seeking him because of the signs. What signs is Lord talking about? He's talking about the miracles and the wonders that he had been performing since the beginning of his ministry. But specifically focusing on two super special miracles that only the Messiah could perform. That being the cleansing of the person suffering from Zaraat and the casting out of the mute demon. Both of which Lord had already performed before the Bread of Life discourse. And these two miracles had clearly authenticated his Messiahship. And whenever we are studying the Gospel accounts, we always need to make sure as to whether the episode that is being studied is before or after the unpardonable sin. For Lord's style of teaching completely changed after the unpardonable sin had been committed. The event which is associated with this extremely special miracle of the casting out of the mute demon. And we will be getting back to Lord's style of teaching later in this video. So the thing is, their reason for seeking him was the very opposite of who he was. It was the very opposite of what he was teaching. And this is the reason why Lord Jesus tells them, You seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. And Lord will now shift from their physical need to the far more important one, their spiritual need. Which is why in verse 27, Lord says, Do not work for the food which perishes but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on Him the Father God has set His seal. Amen. Therefore they said to Him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. Is salvation by works? Of course not. And neither is Lord saying so. But there is one specific work that is needed from every single person to attain salvation, to attain eternal life. And that is to believe in the one whom the Father has sent. To believe, to have faith in Yeshua, to be the Messiah, our Lord and Savior, is a kind of work. The only work that is required. And the unbelievers choose to not do this one thing that is required of them. They choose to not do the work of God by not accepting the gift, the most precious gift that the Father has given. It is free for us, but the Lord had to pay the ultimate price. 
and this work of God to believe in him whom he has sent is the heart of this entire discourse. Verse 35, Lord says, Anihu lechem hachayim. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Amen. Verse 40, Lord says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Amen. In the 47th verse, Lord says, He who believes has eternal life. And in the 69th words, Shimon Kepha says, We have believed and have come to know that thou art the Holy One of God. Amen wa Amen. Throughout the entire discourse, the focal point is on believing the one whom the Father has sent, that being Jesus the Christ. In the 54th verse, Lord says, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. The same thing Lord says in a non-parabolic way in the 40th verse, which we just read. Both the verses are saying one and the same thing. Verse 54 is in parabolic terms and verse 40 is the simplified version of the 54th verse. And we're going to get back to this parable aspect yet again in the third section. But as of now, let's go to the second section. Shemot 16, a foreshadow of the true bread from heaven, the very strong New Testament shades found in Exodus 16. There are many passages in the Tanakh that point to the Christ, that are a type of the Messiah, passages that foreshadow the Promised One, and Manna, which is mentioned for the first time in Exodus 16, also foreshadows the Messiah. Now most brothers and sisters in the body are aware of this aspect, however very few have knowledge of, and I haven't come across any commentaries that put spotlight on, some of the things that we are about to learn in connection to Exodus 16. What we're going to see in this section is how Shemot 16 has very strong shades of things that are found in the New Testament. Let's read verse 7. It says, And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumblings against the Lord. And what are we that you grumble against us? From the verses that follow, we know that in the evening our ancestors were to receive meat, and in the morning they would have manna. Now the thing is that this verse says that in the morning they would see the glory of the Lord. There is a reason why it says so. And it does not say so only because of the miracle of the manna that Lord made to happen every single day while they were in the wilderness. But it says the glory of the Lord because he who is the fruition of the manna is the glory of the Lord. The Shekhinah glory in a completely new form, that is, in the form of a man. And this is spoken of in John 1 verse 14 where the Apostle John says, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And it is also spoken of in Isaiah 9 verse 2, which says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. These verses speak of the Mashiach, who is the visible manifestation of the presence of the Lord. Not in the form of light or fire or cloud, but in a completely new form, the form of a man, the God-man. Let's check out another New Testament shade in Shemot 16, which you might find in some commentaries. Let's read verse 15a. It says, When B'nai Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Their questioning approach towards the manna is kind of similar to them asking questions to each other in connection to the Messiah's identity. And it is so much more similar to their grumbling that is found in Bamidbar. Let's read chapter 11 verse 6. It says, But now our appetite is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. Chapter 21 verse 5 says, The people spoke against God and Moshe. Why have you brought us up out of Mitzrayim to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. They are talking about manna. The grumbling of our ancestors in these verses of Bamidbar is so very similar to the grumbling found in John chapter 6, where the fruition of manna takes place. Let's read verses 41 and 42. It says, Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, Is not this Yeshua ben Yosef, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? You see their reaction? They react in the same way their fathers did back in Numbers 21. And once again, in these verses from the Torah, we find the shades of the episodes found in the New Testament. 
Now another thing dear brothers and sisters that I'd like to share over here with all of you which is in connection to the ministry work is that reading this words from Numbers 21 in this video on John chapter 6 gives me immense joy for it was in our non-illustration video on Numbers 21 the serpent on the pole that I had spoken of Lord willing being able to make a video on manna. And because of Lord's blessings it has come true today as this video is being recorded. Without him none of this would ever be possible. And for all eternity, I will keep on thanking Lord, yet it would be so very insufficient. I also thank with all my heart every single brother and sister who has been praying for and is associated with the work that is being done at El Shaddai House of Bible Learning. Your association with this Lord blessed ministry has rewards that have kingdom implications. Now let's proceed to the next New Testament shade found in Exodus 16. Let's read verses 16 to 18. It says, this is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it every man as much as he should eat. You shall take an omer apiece according to the number of persons each of you has in his tent. B'nai Israel did so, and some gathered much and some gathered little. When they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess, and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. Now what's so very New Testament like over here in these verses? Those who gathered much had no excess, and those who gathered little had no lack, and everyone had as much as they required. This is so similar to salvation. For he that has done more number of good deeds, and he that has committed more number of sins, makes no difference whatsoever in terms of justification. For salvation has nothing to do with works. It is the doing of the Lord. And when a person believes in Jesus as his Lord and Savior, he or she attains salvation and is secure forever. And this is so similar to the gathering mentioned over here in Exodus 16. Whether in excess or little, nobody lacked and they were all satiated. Manna was food for their body. Christ is food for our soul. Manna sustained them until physical death. The Messiah makes us to overcome spiritual death. Let's read a few verses from the New Testament which speak of salvation and the extremely crucial aspect of works not having anything to do with it. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. The Apostle Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Galatians 2.16 says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Titus 3 verses 4 and 5a, Paul says, But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us not on the basis of the deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. Amen va Amen. Luke 23 verses 39 to 43, One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Amen. Until the very last point in his life, this brother of ours was a criminal. And then he was saved only because he believed Yeshua to be his Melech Mashiach, the King Messiah. And think ye not, dear brothers and sisters, that we are not criminals. We too are criminals. We all are big time criminals. We don't need to be an actual murderer or a thief to be a criminal. Those who understand what the Bible says regarding the inner being of the natural man, that is before being born again, understand very well what sort of a heart an unregenerated person has. And my unbelieving Jewish brothers and sisters who are watching this video, please don't think that one can accept Yeshua towards the end of their life. For who among us knows how long he or she is going to live? The time for you to accept Messiah Yeshua is now. Do not harden your hearts as most of our ancestors did when our own Messiah presented the kingdom the first time. This brother of ours was saved because he believed in Yeshua. This brother has eternal life and would never be condemned, just as Romans 8 verse 1 says. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Justification is only by faith in the Messiah. No matter how many so-called good deeds one has done or how much more of a sinner one has been, 
excess or lack of either of the two does not matter whatsoever for eternal life is the gift of the father in and through his son Jesus the Christ in Acts 4 verse 12 the apostle Peter says and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved this is the entire theme of the father which is why Lord in John chapter 6 says I am the living bread that came down out of heaven if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Brothers, with this we come to the end, not of the video, but to the end of the second section, wherein through Lord's help we have seen the strong New Testament shades that are found when the Torah speaks of manna. And brothers, here it says, verse 51a, for from this verse we transition into the third section, wherein among a few very important points we look ahead, that is in connection to John 6, we look ahead to the crucifixion and the Lord's Supper. So the entire verse says, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now before we look ahead to the crucifixion and the Lord's Supper, we first need to understand the requirement for eternal life at this point in time. That is when this discourse of the bread of life was being given. At this point in time, Lord's crucifixion had not yet taken place. Our ancestors had no clue, even the disciples did not understand that the Messiah needed to die in order for man to have eternal life. At this point, they did not need to believe in the death, burial and resurrection of the Messiah that he died for their sins, that he defeated sin and conquered death by being resurrected. At this point in time, all that was required of them was to believe his words, to believe him to be their Messiah. Them believing at this point would give them the life that Lord Jesus was offering them. And when the Messiah says that, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day, he is not speaking in literal terms, something that most in the crowd felt was the case. He was speaking in parabolic terms. And if you remember, this is what I said at the beginning of this video when I said that we would be getting back to Lord's style of teaching. Why did Lord change his teaching style? Why did he begin to teach the crowds in parables? It was because of the rejection of his messiahship by the Jewish leaders, wherein the works which the messiah had done through the Ruach HaKodesh were ascribed by the Jewish leaders to Baal Zabub, which caused them to commit the unpardonable sin. And this is the reason why there was a seismic shift in Lord's ministry, his operating style, his teaching, wherein he shifted from clarity in his teaching to a parabolic style of teaching. Now here's the thing, if the people had been seeking the truth, they would have believed him. They would have understood that he was not teaching in literal terms. For in this very discourse, Lord tells them that he wasn't speaking literally. And where can this be found? It is in the verses where Lord being conscious of their grumbling said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Ruach, the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Amen. So very clearly Lord says that the flesh profits nothing. Although speaking parabolically, he is telling them that he is not asking them to literally eat his flesh and drink his blood. Lord says, what then if they saw him ascending to where he was before? How could this happen if they literally ate his flesh? Or how could they eat his flesh if he ascended before they could do so? Very clearly, Lord is telling them that his words are not to be taken literally. And that it is not about the flesh whatsoever. For the flesh counts for nothing. When Lord says it is the spirit who gives life, he is saying that eternal life has nothing to do with the flesh, but is through the Ruach. The Messiah is talking about being born of the spirit. That which is found in the most important discourse given in the Bible, John chapter 3, when Lord taught Nakdimon, that is Nicodemus. And when Lord says the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life, what he means is that the word is the seed from the kingdom parables that grows and bears fruit that gives eternal life. Although speaking parabolically, very clearly Lord is telling them that his words regarding eating his flesh and drinking his blood are not to be taken literally whatsoever. Thus, at this point in time, all that was required to attain eternal life was to believe Yeshua to be their Messiah, the one promised in the Tanakh. And as we studied in the first section of this video, throughout this discourse, Lord told them over and over again to believe Him to be the one the Father had sent. Having understood the requirement for eternal life at this point in time, let's now look ahead to Lord's last Passover meal before His crucifixion. 
wherein the eating of the matzah and the drinking of the wine become an ordinance which everyone who believes in Lord Yeshua will have to observe as a remembrance of his sacrifice and the proclamation of his death until he comes. And it says until he comes, which means we proclaim not only his death, but his death and resurrection. For our Lord is alive and thus he will come back. And Lord over here is not teaching transubstantiation, wherein the bread and wine turn into his body and blood. Nor is he teaching consubstantiation, wherein his body and blood coexist with the bread and the wine. No, Lord is not talking about either of the two. Lord is commanding us to do this in remembrance of him, proclaiming his death and resurrection. Symbolic aspects of the physical redemption from the land of Mitzrayim, the house of bandage, had now taken over a far greater symbolism. The spiritual redemption from the bandage of sin and death for everyone who accepts Yeshua as the Lord and Savior. The Messiah's last supper before his crucifixion was the fruition of the Passover and the institution of the Lord's Supper. And thus, whenever we partake of the communion, may none of us partake of it without understanding what it is that we are partaking of. May none of us partake of it without understanding what the bread and the wine stand for. Each of us needs to understand that the bread and the wine are symbolic of the death of the Messiah, that we are cleansed of our sins only through His blood, and that through Him alone is eternal life. So this was regarding the Lord's Supper, and I really wish to share the amazing aspect from Mishle over here. However, I won't be doing so, for that has already been explained by one of the best Bible teachers of our times. Let's now get back to Yohanan chapter 6 to delve into another extremely crucial point that is not known by most in the body and for this reason among a few other ones not found in the walk of most believers. Let's read verse 58 and see an exegetical aspect in this verse and take so much from it homiletically. Lord says, This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. What is it that I am talking about in this verse? The English words translated over here as eight and eats have two different words in the Greek. The former that is eight uses a Greek word which in the most basic sense means to eat, to take food, to eat a meal. However, the latter, that is the word translated eats, uses the Greek word trogon, which is a lexeme of the lemma trogo, which means to gnaw, to chew, and has a continual aspect to it in comparison to the former Greek word. Young's literal translation while rendering the lexeme of the lemma trogo every single time translates it as eating, which shows us that there is a continual aspect associated with this Greek word. And the continual chewing on this bread in a homiletical sense would be that after being born again, Lord should be the topmost priority in our life. We need to continually delve into the scriptures, continually chew on his word, and this would cause a continual spiritual union with Christ which can happen only when we keep chewing on his word. A continual delving into the Bible, not as a routine thing, but a continual delving into the scriptures with all our heart, an open heart that is ready to receive what the Ruach is telling us, which would make us to come closer to the Lord and walk in a way that is pleasing in Abba's sight. Believers need to have a continual spiritual union, a continually ongoing spiritual intimacy with the Messiah. And now, brothers, let's enter the last section of this video. The Rem is found through the intertwining between Manna and the Shabbat. So what is this all about? Manna and Shabbat observance are spoken of for the first time in Exodus chapter 16. Why did Lord associate the Manna with Shabbat? Why does Shmo chapter 16 speak of Manna and Shabbat together? Why is Manna connected with the commencement of Shabbat observance? The intertwining between Manna and Shabbat and between Exodus 16 and John 6 is rooted in the aspect of one certain specific kind of work that is required of us and that is to believe in Yeshua as the Messiah. We studied verses 27 to 29 in the first section where Lord told the crowd of what is the work that they needed to do. And this in turn in the entire theme of the Father contains the completed work of Lord Jesus, Him being the fulfillment of what the Manna foreshadowed. And Shabbat is not just a foreshadow, a taste of the coming age, the Olam Haba, but more so it was a foreshadow of our rest in the Messiah. And our resting in Him takes place by us doing the work that the Father wants us to do. That is to believe in Lord Yeshua, who is the bread that came down from heaven to give life to the world. Dear brothers and sisters, impress this upon your heart. Without the bread which came down out of heaven, there is no life. And only through this true bread, we have everlasting life. 
Through this manna, we find true eternal rest. But those who choose to not believe in the bread that came down out of heaven will always hunger for life and spend all eternity in absolute unrest. And with this, dear brethren, we come to the end of one of the most important chapters in the Bible, John chapter 6 and even Exodus 16. Shalom, joy and truly life everlasting to everyone who has believed in the name of the one who is the bread of life, Yeshua Hanad Zarati. Amen.